That period that we built Kings Island was the great proliferation of parks in the United States. There were more theme parks built in the 70s than any other period before or since. I want to move Coney Island. I want Taft Broadcasting to buy it. We'll build a new theme park together. We'll incorporate Hanna-Barbera. I was going to have a showdown board meeting within the Coney Island Company about moving this park. Fern began, he said, are you, are you sure you want to do this? And I said, absolutely. On July 4th, uh, 1972, it was like somebody turned on the spigot. A huge reservoir opened up and people started pouring in. And they poured in and they poured in every day for the remainder of the 1972 season. We were averaging 25 to 30,000 people a day. It was unbelievable, the uh, number of people. The, the people who came up in the beginning, they paid their money and they walked through there, and, and I'll tell you, it was just fun to stand there. Their jaws dropped. When we came back, we were all absolutely white and scared to death. And we said, what did we create? For nearly 40 years, Kings Island, located 20 miles north of Cincinnati, Ohio, has been a popular destination for families and thrill seekers alike. Join me as we reveal some hidden history and relive some fond memories of Kings Island. To tell the story of Kings Island, I had to find the man who started it all. And my search led me to the general manager of Garfield Suites Hotel in downtown Cincinnati. I was gonna meet the father of Kings Island. My name is Gary Walks. I was general manager at Kings Island from its inception, uh, going back to 1970 under construction and I was there through its first season, 72, and then I moved to Richmond, Virginia to build another park, the sister park, King's Dominion. I started at Coney Island as a young man of 25 years of age in 1961, and my family was involved with the park. And I worked there till 1964 <coughs> and, and uh, witnessed a few floods, but in 64, we had the fourth highest flood in history. It was 66.6 uh, feet. Uh, there was the great flood of 37, there was a big flood in uh, 1913, and one in 1945. This was the fourth highest. And it was a horrible flood. It did a lot of destruction to uh, Coney Island. And as a young man at the time, I guess youth looks way down the road instead of right around the corner, and I was thinking, what future does Coney Island really have with, with floods like this? That turned my mindset for the rest of my life. After that, I, pr I probably uh, spent half my time thinking about how to move that park and the other half how to operate the park. In my opinion, Kings Island was literally conceived in 1964 because uh, I devoted a great deal of time trying to figure out a way to move Coney Island to another location. And I spent the better part of, uh, let's see, that was 64. We merged with the Taft Broadcasting Company in July of 69. So I spent almost five years uh, preparing for the day when we could build a Kings Island type park. And I did a lot of work. Uh, I wrote almost a thesis on it. I traveled extensively. I figured out what we wanted to do for the concept of Kings Island, uh, what, what is popular. I visited every amusement park in the country. I traveled to Europe in 1963. And I saw many things that left me with an impression of, of, of how to design the concept for Kings Island. So we literally had the concept for Kings Island. It wasn't called Kings Island then. We didn't have a name for this. But uh, I had a concept for that park before we ever merged with the Taft Broadcasting Company. So the story of the merger is interesting, but when we did merge, we were ready to go. You know, it was fascinating in those days because when we got in bed with Taft, Taft essentially threw the keys at me and said, go build it. 
And I knew I had to hire a couple of guys and say, here are the keys, you do it. And Jack Rouse says, one, I threw the keys at him. We need a live show department. And he did it. This other guy said, we need a merchandising department. And he did it. Well, so Gary threw the keys and, you know, I caught the keys and then uh, it was kind of important that I find somebody to do it with me because I wasn't all that talented. So uh, I threw part of the keys anyway to a guy named Carmen de Leon, who of course still is here in Cincinnati, and uh, we sort of took off from there. It was a, a wonderful opportunity for a lot of young men, including Mr. Spiegel. He w worked at the front gate at Coney Island as a seasonal employee, and I used to ask him, what would you like to do in your life? And he said, well, I'm, I'm going to be a teacher at Amelia High School. Well, about a year later, when Kings Island came up, uh, it was kind of like World War II. We had a lot of planes to fly, but we didn't have enough pilots. And I had to hire a bunch of pilots in a hurry. So I saw Denny, and he certainly looked like an energetic, smart young guy. And I said, how would you like to get in this business? And I said, uh, several of us have to go up to Kings Island and start working on this park, but we don't have enough people to stay at Coney Island to help run Coney Island. So he jumped at it, and uh, he was a great fit. He was just a natural in the business. And, and he went up the ladder pretty quickly because as soon as I got through with Kings Island, I was only the general manager there for the first season because then I had to move out of town to Richmond, Virginia to build King's Dominion. So it was an opportunity for Danny. It was an opportunity for a lot of young men. It was really, uh, really great. So Gary Walks was the father of King's Island. I guess that would make Dennis Spiegel, the president of International Theme Park Services, the fun-loving uncle of King's Island. I worked at Coney Island uh, from uh, junior high school through high school through college. When I graduated from college, I became part of the management team at Coney Island, and uh, that evolved into a position of full-time employment at Kings Island uh, when we opened in 1972. Well, Kings Island uh, was, uh, it was very interesting because it was, really, uh, it was really the beginning of the industry. It came at that point. Uh, there weren't many theme parks at that point in time. With the exception of Disneyland and a couple of other properties out in California, there were only two other Six Flags parks at that time. And uh, we uh, began planning Kings Island, realizing that Coney Island, our existing park, was uh, couldn't grow. Uh, we needed a bigger facility for this market. Uh, it was landlocked. We had the river on the south side of Coney Island. We had uh, Route 52 on the north side. We had uh, the River Downs Racetrack on the uh, east side and the little town of California on the west side. So we only had 155 acres at Coney Island. It was pretty well maxed out at that time. For a long time, uh, I had to solve some internal problems within Coney Island about moving. Number one, I was a young maverick that wanted to move a park that was extremely successful. We were voted time and time again as the uh, world's finest amusement park, the number one amusement park. This was before the advent of theme parks, but we really were the finest amusement park in the country uh, by all of our peers' definition. And uh, for a young man like me to run around even within our own organization and say, let's get out of here when we were very, very successful, uh, I wasn't uh, taken terribly, terribly uh, seriously in those days. And I finally won over a few people in the organization, and even my father, who, who I loved and adored, but he was sort of in the middle of the road. I think in his heart he knew I was right, because competition was coming. We couldn't stand the floods. But he was in a va of an age where I don't think he wanted to be a pioneer in this effort. So we had another person in the company. He was not a majority stockholder. He was a significant stockholder, and his name was Charles Sawyer. He was Secretary of Commerce under Truman. He was ambassador to Belgium in World War II. He was quite an interesting man. He was a senior partner of uh, Taft, Satinius, and Hollister. He was a very... Uh, a uh, very supportive guy and everything we did. He never interfered with the management of Coney Island because frankly he was in Washington and Europe most of the time. Very supportive until I wanted to move this park. 
So I started making presentations to him, trying to sell him on the idea. I even flew him down to Six Flags over Georgia, the year it opened in 1967, to show him what a modern theme park was and what we were going to be facing in our area sooner or later if we didn't move. Well, he, I couldn't get him to budge. He was in his 80s, and I said, as I said earlier, a young man looks way down the road, an old man barely looks around the corner. So I couldn't get him to budge on the idea, and I was kind of frustrated. And then push came to shove, and I decided to have a Coney Island board of directors meeting. And uh, frankly, I had lined up all of the stockholders. And between some friends and family, we had the majority of uh, control of the stock. And I was <laughs> here I was again as a young man, I was going to have a showdown board meeting within the Coney Island Company about moving this park. And I thought, boy, oh boy, I've got to go up against Mr. Sawyer when he's already told me he doesn't like the idea. And this would have been a classic board meeting. I, but you know what? It never happened. And why didn't it ever happen? Because all of a sudden, what I had been preaching for a long time, we had such a marvelous market area. We were a wagon wheel city, I called it. We were, we were Cincinnati in the middle of Indianapolis and Dayton and Lexington and Louisville and Columbus. None of these cities had any entertainment, any amusement parks. And uh, we had drawn from those markets very well at Coney Island. So I knew if we had a major theme park, it would be an outstanding market area. Well, some people on the West Coast had the same idea. They, they had spotted this market area. And it was a guy named Fess Parker, who was a big television star in those days. He had that Western series on television. And uh, uh, lo and behold, I wake up one morning, and the Enquirer has a uh, headline. It said, Fess Parker to build a uh, theme park. And it was in northern Kentucky at the confluence of I-71 and I-75. And my heart sank because I knew this was f for real. I knew this was going to happen. I, I knew the, some of the people he had behind him. I, I knew um, he used a company called e Economic Research Association, which was a major player in those days. And they had crunched all the numbers. and and. Uh, all of a sudden, I went from a kid who, who was not taking terribly serious to overnight, I, I had instant credibility because I had been predicting this stuff for five years. So he really shook things up. And frankly, I had a pit in the, the, the bottom of my stomach because I knew this was going to happen. And I knew instantly that Coney Island was going to go from the world's finest amusement park to one of two things a second-rate park like La Swordsville, which I didn't want to be a part of, neither did the staff of Coney Island want to be a part of, or it would have put Coney Island out of business. Uh, Fess Parker, who uh, was known very well at uh, that time for his roles in Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone, had uh, made an overture to build a theme park over in Boone County, Kentucky, right across the river. Had that happened, it would have put Coney Island out of business. Coincidentally, uh, Coney Island at, uh, in 1967 or 8, uh, we were having the WKRC Pops concerts in Moonlight Gardens. Arthur Fiedler was there, people of that stature. They were on Sunday afternoon and they were absolutely wonderful. And uh, because Taft Broadcasting owned <coughs> KRC, some of the officials from the corporate office would come up to Moonlight Gardens and watch these Pops concerts. And one day I was up there and uh, I had met the president of TAP Broadcasting, Lawrence Rogers, and got to know him a little bit. And uh, I decided because of uh, making that acquaintance and knowing TAF Broadcasting had recently acquired Hanna-Barbera, I was gonna take a flyer knock on his door, take my presentation over to him, and see if he wanted to get in the amusement park business. Buy Coney Island, we'll build the park, Taft put up the money. So I told my father I was going to go do this, and he said, call him. So I called Bud Rogers, and Bud had no idea what was on my mind. I think he was probably thinking I was going to make a United Appeal call or something of that nature. 
And uh, he said, sure, uh, come, come, come over. And I, I had packed my valise. I had all these materials, all this presentation stuff. I had everything from renderings to concepts to pro formas to market studies. This was the same presentation I had given Mr. Sawyer for two hours, uh, not to mention people within our own, own uh, organization. So I, I go see Bud Rogers. It was, um, uh, this was 68, late 1968. I go in his office and I'll never forget, he was on the phone and he kind of motioned to me, come on in and I'm dragging this big valise of materials in and he had absolutely no idea what I was doing there. He hung up and he said, he was very gracious. He said, now what can I do for you? And I said, uh, I said, Bud, uh, I'm going to need an hour of your time. And he looked at me and he said, well, that's all right. So I opened this material up and I said, Bud, I want to move Coney Island. I want Taft Broadcasting to buy it. We'll build a new theme park together. We'll incorporate Hanna-Barbera. And here's the rationale behind it. And I proceeded to go through all this stuff again, which I'd gone through so many times. I was pretty good at it at that point. I could do it with my eyes closed. And after I was through, he was really sort of nonplussed, because again, he didn't know why I was coming over there. And he said, uh, he paused and he said, uh, very interesting. And he said, let me think about this, talk about this, and I'll call you. And I left his office and I told my father about the visit and I said, Dad, I think there's some interest there, but Bud's going to call me. So he did. He called me a couple of weeks later and we had lunch in the, at the Palm Court in the old Netherland Hotel and this was over the Christmas holidays. And he kind of reaffirmed again. He said, are you, are you sure you want to do this? And I said, absolutely. He said, uh, are you and your father on the same page? My father was president of Coney Island at that time. And I said, we absolutely are. And he said, well, we have one more meeting. I want you to meet Mr. Meacham, who is the new chairman of the board at Taft Broadcasting, and I'm gonna set up a lunch at the Masonette. Well, uh, a week or two later, we did that. And I met Mr. Meacham at the Masonette. And I remember, among other things, I took over some uh, stock performance statistics from the Great Southwest Corporation, which at the time owned all of the uh, Six Flags theme parks. And of course, <laughs> the stock was going straight up. And I showed that to Mr. Meacham and how it was possible to do the same thing. And uh, in my opinion, I think the vaccination took at that luncheon. At the end of that luncheon, uh, Mr. Meacham asked me, he said, uh, how about Mr. Sawyer? Because he had worked with Mr. Sawyer in the Taft Law Firm before he switched over and became chairman of the board of Taft Broadcasting. He said, where are you with Mr. Sawyer? And I said, well, quite frankly, um, Mr. Sawyer is not aware of this meeting. And I explained to him my history of, with Mr. Sawyer and, and uh, uh, he had been opposed to this, but I also said, I think he's very approachable now because his stock is threatened by Fess Parker's proposed investment. So I would think there would be a big change of heart. But I wanted to talk to you all first to see if you were willing to go along with this and then I was going to go back and talk to him. Well, uh, Mr. Meacham said, let me talk to him. I know him quite well. I think I can convince him. And, uh, and he did. And the next thing I knew, I get a call from Mr. Sawyer and he, his mind had totally changed. He said, let's get on with this project. Come down to my office. I want to make some phone calls to some banks because we've got to stop this Fess Parker right away. We have to stop this man from getting his financing. So I got down to Mr. Sawyer's office and it was really kind of fascinating because he was a very interesting, influential man. To make a long story short, we shut down that project. Fess Parker could not get financing. And uh, not too long after that, we announced the merger of Coney Island and Taft Broadcasting. That was July of 1969. And uh, 
When we announced that merger the next day, I ceased doing everything operationally I ever did at Coney Island, and I devoted 18 hours a day to starting Kings Island. Gary Wax was the uh, young man who was really uh, promoting this idea within the family. And it was interesting at that time, Taft Broadcasting Company, which was a well-known company here in Cincinnati, had, uh, which owned television and radio stations, Channel 12, uh, WKRC, uh, was looking to expand. They had just bought Hanna-Barbera Productions, which was Fred Flintstone, uh, Barney Rubble, Yogi Bear, Scooby-Doo, and they were looking for a way to exploit those characters. I and my associates were looking for ways to broaden Hanna-Barbera's scope from just uh, cartoons. And one of the obvious uh, uh, roadmaps was what Disney had done uh, based on their cartoon empire. And of course, uh, amusement parks were a, a very important part of that. And uh, the president and chairman of that company uh, flew out to California and had a, a meeting with Roy Disney. Uh, after we approached Taft Broadcasting, and they seemed to like the idea of buying Coney Island and starting a theme park because of their connection with Hanna-Barbera, then they went out to see the Disney group to kind of check out Coney Island to see if these guys were for real. Even though we were in Cincinnati, we didn't know each other that well. Following up on that, um, had a luncheon meeting with Roy Disney, who was Walt Disney's brother. Walt had, had, uh, was dead. Roy Disney was sort of the business brains of the operation. And um, talked to Roy Disney about whether going into the amusement park business was a smart thing. And he spent quite a bit of time on the subject. Um, the lunch lasted, God, several hours. But at the end of the luncheon, it was very funny because he said, you know, I can't help but laugh that you're out here in Los Angeles talking to me about the amusement park business because the finest um, small amusement park in America is right in your hometown, Coney Island. Interestingly enough, in 1953, uh, Walt came to Cincinnati to uh, consult with my father and uncle who ran the park at the time and were the, um, among the very few people in the country that supported him in his venture. Most people didn't think he had a chance. They didn't understand what he was trying to do. My father and uncle backed him totally. They went out to Los Angeles. So it's a long story, but I think ever since those days, Coney Island had a place in its heart in the Disney group. And I think the Taft officials uh, found that out when they went out there. Well, the two came together. Uh, the families and Taft Broadcasting Company, and the deal was put together, and um, it was over, and um, and merged in about six months. Our large model is our attempt at an exact representation of what our park should look like in May of 1972. And the concept is very much like a four-leaf clover. Uh, one leaf is Hanna-Barbera land fantasy area for the entire family. Another leaf is frontier land. Another leaf is a reproduction of an old amusement park of uh, 50 years ago that we're calling Coney Island. And the fourth leaf over here where you see the pool and the Eiffel Tower, we're calling International Street. The, these four areas, actually five areas of Kings Island, it's kind of a clover leaf concept. And in my mind, I was so impressed with what I'd seen in Europe and the New York World's Fair and the Canadian National Exposition that I wanted this kind of soft international flavor as you walked in the park, the fountains, the flowers, the trees, the Eiffel Tower. But we had to have, obviously, several other areas. Hanna-Barbera was a no-brainer. That's why we merged in the first place. So Coney Island's Land of Oz, which sort of our children land, became Hanna-Barbera with all its reputation and promotional value. It was a natural fit, fantastic. Then I decided we, we're the Ohio River, we had to have a historical area, we had to have Rivertown. We're a German town, so we had to have the uh, German area and the beer garden and that kind of thing. And then the last qu quadrant of the park 
had to be Coney Island. And it was almost a themed area of an old amusement park. So we put the Coney Island stuff there. Interestingly enough, a lot of the Six Flags parks had taken the Disney philosophy. Uh, they were moving away from the traditional stuff. They didn't want roller coasters, cotton candy, games. They didn't want any of that because that had sort of a stigma of the old world. We knew in many respects they were on the right track, but how can you not take up to Kings Island, which was so bloody successful at Coney Island? Roller coasters, cotton candy, games, but we could theme it in, as in a historical park, so that's what we did. My first trip to Kings Island, the site of Kings Island, uh, Gary Wax, who was my boss, who had hired me, uh, said uh, one day at Coney Island, let's go out and look at this, this site that we're, we're looking at developing. And uh, I don't think I'd been any further north than Kenwood at that time in Cincinnati. And uh, we drove from Coney Island. There wasn't, uh, 71 was just being completed then. And uh, we went out the, the back way. We got up to Kings Island and it was literally a cornfield. Uh, it was a farm on both sides of the road. And uh, we had our blue jeans and our boots and our sticks and we started walking the site and saw what a magnificent site it would be to build a theme park. And I remember we, as we walked the area, we were talking about the elements that we could put into the park. And if you remember the uh, train ride at Kings Island, we walked back to that huge ravine area and we said, wouldn't this be a great area to put a bridge across, have our train come around this area, have the Indeds attack with the cowboys? And uh, that's how Kings Island really was born. It was a marvelous piece of property. Uh, the uh, Taft uh, folks picked out this piece of property. It was, uh, the King family had it on sale. It was, I think it was about 1,600 acres. Uh, 800 on one side of the uh, 71 and 800 acres on the other side. And uh, early on, I had actually looked for property myself, and I found a piece of property on Claremont County off of 275. But this was a better location, particularly with feeder cities like Columbus and Indianapolis. And uh, it, was, it was a great location. There wasn't anything out there. In 1969, 71, I-71 wasn't even completed. Uh, we had to... Uh, we had to uh, redesign two interchanges with Warren County. They did all that for us. You know, it was amazing. We got two interchanges, uh, Kings Island Drive, the land and the park for about $35 million. It was a cornfield. Uh, the uh, Kings Island Drive, <laughs> non-existent. Uh, of course, the, that was, there was a road coming up uh, uh, right at the front gate of the park almost. Uh, which was the main thoroughfare through that area. So we, we began planning and talking about how we could route people through the area. What would be, the again, the best use of the land? Uh, and we planned that parking lot out front, that, which, is, uh, which was originally about 110 acres of parking. Uh, Coney Island in its entirety was only 155 acres. So we had basically a, a third of, our, of the Coney Island park, if you will, comparable in parking at the Kings Island. So it was a, it was a cornfield. It was very rural. Uh, there was basically nothing north of Fields Ertle Road at that time. Uh, and uh, and it, was, it was wonderful property to, to build a, a park, particularly the way all of the, uh, uh, with the convergence that would come later of the highways. Since 1972, International Street has been the centerpiece of Kings Island. For millions of visitors, this is the first step they take into this magical place, where beloved characters are waiting to greet them with wide smiles and big hugs. This is also a place where families gather to take that picture so that this moment can be frozen in time forever. In this segment, we're gonna take a stroll down International Street, discover some history, and find out why this place is so special for many of us. Two or three things that Coney Island did not have that were the wave of the future. Coney Island experimented uh, in terms of when you got on the rides, how you paid. In, in the 40s and 50s, uh, you paid cash. If you wanted to ride a coaster, you paid a quarter. 
Then we went to a universal ticket system. And then we went to a modified pay one price system where you got a string around your, you know, the band and you paid $5 and you got the band and you could ride all day with that. Then when we opened Kings Island, it was obviously pay one price, you pay to get in. Now I gotta tell you, uh, Coney Island those days, it cost 50 or 75 cents to get in the park and we're announcing this new theme park where it's going to cost six dollars to get in the park and I'll tell you we had a real public relations nightmare in front of us because number one the world loved Coney Island. Cincinnati absolutely loved Coney Island. They loved the Island Queen. They loved the swimming pool. They loved Moonlight Gardens. Everybody grew up there. They fell in love there. You're going to tear all this down and get rid of it? You're crazy. And then you're going to build something up north and charge us six dollars to get in. Um, we, we really uh, had, when we were under construction at Kings Island, we had as many tours as possible of people through there and press and, and so forth. But I'll tell you, it, you, you never knew how, I, I honestly think I knew, I thought it was a no-brainer trying to do this thing. But when you're putting up the money, as Taft Broadcasting did, it's not quite a no-brainer. It's a risk, it's a gamble, and, and, and I always admired them for that because even though we were all pretty sure of this thing, uh, you never know until the people came in. Pay one price was a big deal, and we got over that public relations deal, and once we did, everybody loved pay one price because they, they paid this money and then they had the psychology as everything else is free all day. So it was a great concept. Well, we designed our entrance to be very, very low. So when you came up and bought your tickets, you didn't quite know what you were getting into. You didn't know what was on the other side of this, and what you were gonna see. And in spite of trying to advertise for this and tours and everything else, uh, we had the, the people who came up in the beginning, they paid their money and they walked through there, and, and I'll tell you, it was just fun to stand there. Their jaws dropped because in spite of the fact they loved Coney Island, Coney Island wasn't in the same league with Kings Island. They looked down International Street, they saw that fountain, they saw the tower, and I, you know, I, I knew we had a winner. I absolutely knew we had a winner because it's like the best movie you ever saw. It's word of mouth. You tell 15 people about this movie, and that's really what happened. When we started planning Kings Island, uh, Gary Wax went out to California and he met with a fellow by the name of uh, Bruce Bushman, and he was really the conceptual designer of particularly International Street. His father was the famous uh, silent movie star Francis X. Bushman, uh, and uh, Bruce Bushman came to Cincinnati and stayed there a while, worked on International Street for us, and what we wanted to do was create this boulevard with a lot of shops and, and retail area with this beautiful fountain. Many lifelong relationships were made at this park. And one shining example of those relationships is the love between Walter Jr. Duff and Nancy Gunther. I'm Walter Duff. I worked at Front Gate Hats and Souvenirs, and I started in 1978. Hi, I'm Nancy Duff. I worked in the merchandise department also at Kings Island, and I worked in the Rivertown section of the park in the trading post. The other thing we didn't have in Coney Island was a big merchandising department. We had a, uh, we had a uh, games department, but we didn't have a lot of merchandising. And I knew International Street was, you know, shop, shop, shops. So I was, uh, among other things, I was pretty heavily involved with United Appeal in the 60s. And uh, one of the guys was one of my key guys who ran McAlpin's in Mount Washington. And uh, I remembered him and I said, God, we need a merchandiser. So I went up and I talked to this fellow. I said, how would you like to get in our business? And, you can do all the shops on International Street. Uh, the great thing I loved about working uh, front gate shops were every day I had a great view of the uh, International uh, Eiffel Tower and I got to see the air show every single day. So most people don't remember but they had parachuters, they had the uh, dog fights, they had hot air balloons. So uh, about five o'clock or seven o'clock somewhere in that time range every day I got to see the air show. International Street was uh, very unique, I think, for the time, especially for Cincinnati and a few of the theme parks. 
International Street was themed with German shop, the Swiss shop, the French shop. Everything had souvenirs from around the world there. And also many souvenirs that were very specific to just Kings Island. The Eiffel Tower, I mean, I, I got tired of seeing the Eiffel Tower as far as on the shelves. There were millions of Eiffel Towers that we sold um, there. But International Street had great flavor, um, great themes to it. The restaurants and the shops were completely themed out. You really did think you were in another country. I knew we wanted a massive fountain. I, I'd seen some beautiful fountains at the New York World's Fair. It had taken a million slides of them. Well, the fountain was, yeah, absolutely there. That was the brainchild and uh, pet project of a fellow by the name of Charlie Flatt, who, who loved water and uh, was a former manager of the Coney Island Sunlight Pool. And Charlie worked very hard uh, on that project, and, uh, and we developed it. It was the longest fountain, uh, certainly in the United States at that time. I believe it was uh, 300 feet long and had several, 300 and some lights underneath it that changed uh, uh, with, a, with a computer program. So it was very unique and uh, it became, uh, and is today, still one of the more beautiful spots within Kings Island. The Eiffel Tower, interestingly enough, was originally planned to be put at Coney Island and it was put on hold. If you remember at Coney Island, there was a ride called the Lost River and the Lost River was going to be torn down and, and the Eiffel Tower was going to be put there. Uh, Gary Walks had, uh, and his family had met with uh, uh, the team from uh, Intamin AG out of uh, Zurich, Switzerland, who built towers of that nature and had it ordered basically, ready to go, and then the idea of Kings Island came up, so it was put on hold. Well, that became the focal point of Kings Island as we built the street, designed the street, and the esplanade of, of International Street around that. The tower was built in Graz, Austria. And they built that park over there, and then they, they pre-assembled sections of it and then took it apart, and they shipped it over here. And that tower went up, and they only had to re-grout 26 bolts in the entire tower. It was the Mercedes-Benz of Eiffel Towers. And it's hard to believe, but we built that tower, including these massive foundations, elevators, paint, lock, stock, and barrel for a million four. Lord knows what that would cost today. It is an icon in the area, and it became the meeting place for everybody at Kings Island. When families would break up, they would come back and say, we'll meet you at the Eiffel Tower at 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock. So that's how the Eiffel Tower came into being. At Coney Island, we did not have a strong live show program. We knew what we didn't have. We knew what was popular with the new theme parks. We knew what we had to get. So we went out and hired a guy named Jack Rouse. Uh, I, I hired Jack from the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. And uh, Jack and his friend Carmen De Leon, they were going to do the live shows for, Kings, uh, for uh, Kings Island. Carmen De Leon lasted a year and he decided this carnival business is not for me. But Jack Rouse stayed on. And they did a marvelous job. And in fact, in the first year, uh, we, we kind of ran out of money. We did not, we weren't able to do everything we wanted to do because we went over budget in some areas because it was all so new and it was very hard to predict. In the early years of the theme park industry, parks largely differentiated themselves on their live entertainment. Arguably, we all had the same rides. So in, in those days, I was the head of opera and music theater at the conservatory and uh, Hell, all my students needed summer employment, and uh, why not Kings Island? So there were musical shows, comedy shows, dance shows, country and western barbershop quartets, clown bands, you know, train rides, melodramas, uh, magicians, jugglers, mimes, and clowns. So uh, the early years, probably you know, a couple hundred plus uh, aspiring young performers. You know, many from CCM in Cincinnati, but many many from Bloomington, University of Michigan, etc. So we built an air structure. I don't know if you remember the old air structure by the Eiffel Tower. We couldn't build a big, massive theater as much as we wanted to. We couldn't build it in the early years. So we built this air structure with a revolving door to keep the air pressure in, and we'd have the, uh, the live show kids in that air, air uh, structure, and it was extremely popular. And again, all these people that came in that remembered Coney Island, they didn't know they were going to get live sh porpoise shows. We had a marvelous porpoise show. And they got all these shows for free. And I mean, it was such a big bang for the buck. 
uh, Saltwater Circus, very popular show at Kings Island. It was actually uh, over on the south side of the park behind the Eiffel Tower uh, between Rivertown and uh, the carousel coming up to Coney Island Mall. There was an area there and it was, uh, it was packed. It was uh, full every show. Uh, it was re really one of the few dolphin shows, uh, certainly in the region, if, if not the only one. So uh, again, like everything else uh, in our industry, everything runs its course after a while and you, and you change it. Uh, and of course, with the Marine Mammal Act and other uh, uh, legislation, there was a lot of pressure on keeping uh, dolphin particularly in captivity and working with them. So uh, eventually we just uh, eliminated that show and took the, uh, took the dolphin show out. Uh, you know, over the year there's been uh, a lot of famous Cincinnatians. I guess the most notable that everyone would recognize today would be Carmen Electra. At the time, she went by Tara Patrick and uh, she was a dancer in our stage show, It's Magic, in 1990. So, uh, you know, she's gone on to, to a level of fame. Uh, but she also had, you know, going back to the 70s, uh, you know, Miss America, Susan Perkins was a performer in 1978 at the park. Uh, you had Susan K. Johnson in 1987. She was Miss Ohio. She was here in the mid 80s, you know, for a couple of years working on our stage shows uh, at the International Showplace Theater. Uh, Nick Lachey, you know, he was a performer here as well with the Barbershop Quartet in, the, you know, the early 90s. So you've had, you know, a lot of people like that that have kind of come through. Then a lot of people that, you know, y if you work in the industry or something, you may know who these people are, you know, whether they work at the like, Clear Channel, like Chuck Ingram uh, was a guy that worked here, Janine Coyle from WGRR. So there's been a lot of people over the years that have worked at Kings Island have gone on to bigger and better things. I try to. I mean, I had hopes and dreams and you know wanted to move to either New York or Hollywood and and try to start a career I think when whether you're a dancer or an actress or a musician working in entertainment you, you have to follow your heart you have to you have to go with it and I you know saved up my money from working here which you know was a little little bit and um, got on a plane and flew to Los Angeles and just decided to go for it. And I mean, I really thank Kings Island so much for, for being a part, a part of that because, I mean, even without, you know, the paycheck from working every week, I wouldn't have been able to go. So in, in, in so many ways, you know, I'm really honored and this is just, it's so cool. I'm trying not to cry because <laughs> I, I don't want my makeup to run. <laughs> No other street in the world crosses this many international boundaries. We've uncovered a lot of hidden history behind this iconic street inside of Kings Island, and I hope we've uncovered a lot of memories for you. Well, it was uh, opening day was chaotic at Kings Island. Uh, the night before, we were till six o'clock in the morning. Uh, finishing the park. Uh, we were actually still putting plants in, we were putting blacktop down, we were still painting, uh, we were still putting up doors, we were putting uh, boats in the water for the rides. Uh, uh, so it was really a, it was a chaotic day. Uh, had we had four more weeks, it would have still been chaotic. That wouldn't have changed a bit. Uh, but it was a great day, and uh, we didn't know what to anticipate. We set up a, uh, a dais at the, uh, uh, underneath the Eiffel Tower. We had the chairman of uh, Taft Broadcasting Company, uh, Charlie Meacham, the president, Dudley Taft, uh, the Walks family, Gary Walks, Ralph Walks. Uh, we had uh, Bill Hanna and uh, Joe Barbera came in from, uh, from the studios. Uh, and we had some other uh, local dignitaries and uh, people of our staff. Well, I was one of the coordinators of the day, so I was standing uh, out basically on the side of the fountain, uh, uh, coordinating the parades coming in and making sure the traffic was flowing correctly. It wasn't an overly crowded day. We only, uh, first day, we only had about 6,000 people. And interestingly enough, at Kings Island, uh, we didn't know, I'll never forget Charlie Meacham said to me, first time I'd ever heard this, he said, I wonder, what if you throw a party and nobody comes? <laughs> and uh, up until July 4th, Kings Island didn't see really any extraordinarily heavy traffic. We had days of five, 6,000, we had some 1,500 days, two and 3,000 days, uh, larger than we'd had at Coney Island at those times, but not overly crowded. 
there wasn't a rush of people in the beginning. And we were a little bit concerned there in the, in the early uh, four to five weeks. People weren't pouring in the park. But the ones that did went out and told 100 people. And all of a sudden, about three or four weeks later, <laughs> they came from all over the place. On July 4th, uh, 1972, it was like somebody turned on the spigot. A huge reservoir opened up and people started pouring in. And they poured in and they poured in every day for the remainder of the 1972 season. We were averaging 25 to 30,000 people a day. It was unbelievable the uh, number of people. Our projected attendance, we told TAP Broadcasting that this park will do two million people the first year. And we put ourselves on the line for that. Well, we originally had projected two million people the first year. That was our financial projection and our attendance projection. We were all naive. We didn't know whether we'd hit that or not. On the final night of the first season, when we closed the door and we turned out the light, and of course we kept a running daily tab, we knew what our attendance was, it was 2,012,000. We were the first theme park in the United States outside of Disney at that time to ever break 2 million people during its first year of operation. So it was a, it was a crazy season. It was wild, it was busy, and we were all very tired at the end. <laughs> So we did two things. We hit our attendance goal and we opened on time. That's another significant thing because now, I mean, here you have a bunch, you have a handful of guys from Coney Island that had moved up to Kings Island for construction. Uh, very able people, very loyal people. We worked with a contractor, C.V. Mesher, and we had construction meetings every week. And those meetings were interesting because the Coney Island people were pushing Mesher. Mesher was pushing Coney Island and we had what I call controlled conflict at these meetings. And I'm conducting these meetings and it was like an atomic reactor. If you push the rod in too far, you're gonna have a damn meltdown. If you don't push it in very far, you're not gonna have enough activity. So I'm trying to gauge this thing and get as much controlled conflict out of this group as I can. And uh, we pulled it off. We built a very solid park. It's the best built park in the country. To properly trace Kings Island's roots, we must first start in another park in a different location. Coney Island opened its doors to the public in 1886 on the banks of the Ohio River near Cincinnati, Ohio. Old Coney areas, uh, 4th of July, Barnum and Bailey, red, white, and blue, exposed light bulbs, the Barker in front of the show, things like that. Just uh, as Coney Island would have looked uh, at the turn of the century or a little later than that. I think it'll be probably one of the most exciting areas in the park because it will be typical of the amusement park as people uh, know an amusement park basically. And really what Coney Island Mall was to be was a reproduction of old Coney Island. Well, we brought a lot of flat rides up, what we call flat rides. We brought the Dodgem, the Whip, and the Cuddle Up. Those are old rides dating back to the, uh, Lord, 20s and 30s of uh, Coney Island. I think we brought the Wild Mouse up. We brought a lot of games. Um, another interesting story about the racer. The shooting star at Coney Island was wildly popular. Uh, it replaced the old Clipper in 1947 and it was one of the great coasters in the country. It was an out and back coaster and it had grav uh, it, it was a uh, negative gravity ride and you'd sail out and back and lift out of your chair and, and it, people just loved that. In any event, as popular as it was, we didn't just want to rebuild the Shooting Star because that wouldn't have been anything new and different. So I researched it a little bit and I, I came up with the thought that racing roller coasters side by side were a big thing in the 1920s. 
And for some reason, they stopped building racing roller coasters. And I said, let's revive that concept. Let's build a racer. So we dealt with a guy in a company in um, Philadelphia called Philadelphia Toboggan. They designed roller coasters and they sold ski ball alleys. They were in a lot of traditional stuff. And there was a wonderful old engineer named John Allen, who was the president of that company, and he'd been trying to retire for years. And I called him and I said, will you help us design this project, John? He was a great guy. He said, Gary, I, I just can't. I'm trying to retire. I've been trying to retire for five years. People are always calling me about stuff. And I said, John, are you going to our convention in Chicago this fall? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, John, I'll see you there. <laughs> and um, we met him at the convention, and my father and I took him to a bar called Well of the Sea in the Sherman House Hotel, and we pumped a few cocktails in him, and us as well, and we walked out of there with a signed agreement that he was going to design the racing roller coaster for us, which he did, and that was a, just a great coaster. People were just thrilled to be racing back and forth, and that was something new. <laughs> This is a double coaster in the sense that two trains are going to race each other. I'm going to leave that incline and come down side by side through these two tracks to see which one can get home first. We have to get them wild. And this is a wild one. And personally, I can't wait to ride it because I like them wild and I build them wild. And I would like to see the people scream from the time they leave that top until they hit back on the brakes. It's interesting that the racer, which was our main feature coaster in Kings Island in its opening year, that was the first roller coaster that had been built in the United States since 1946. There were, there were no coasters being built. Disney didn't have any coasters. The new Six Flags parks didn't have any coasters. And the old existing family parks had their own coasters and just kept remodeling them. And uh, ironically, later on, some of the my good friends who ran the uh, Six Flags parks, they came up, and I'll never forget the day they saw the racer, because they didn't have a roller coaster. They saw the racer coaster with a line about a half a block long. I knew immediately they were going to throw their principles out the window and had roller coasters, and that's exactly what they did. When that coaster hit the market, Everybody and anybody from Disney to Six Flags to whomever, Universal Studios, everybody came to Cincinnati to see that roller coaster. Then became, that became the great proliferation and the beginning of the roller coaster was reborn. So since then, 1972, literally thousands of roller coasters have been built around the world all because of the, what the racer spawned. Well, I actually would have the record for the most rides, uh, you know, on the racer right now. My number, my, my ride count would be 11,973. Uh, it's something I started in 1981 uh, on the racer. It's kind of, uh, you know, as a kid going to Coney Island and later Kings Island in the 70s, you know, I was, you know, was just kind of addicted to this business. You know, the atmosphere, you know, was one of the things that always grabbed me. So, you know, buying a season pass in 81, I was up here a lot. And, uh, you know, if you go someplace often enough, you're going to have numbers on something. So that's kind of the reason, you know, behind the numbers with the racer. Nothing I did intentionally. It just kind of developed into what it did. Uh, but, you know, it was a great ride, you know, in the 70s. It was a great ride in the 80s. It's still a great ride today. Well, we brought the uh, flying scooters from, from Coney Island, the old wind sail where you went around and you, you created your draft and, and did it. We brought the monster from Coney Island. We brought the scrambler. We brought uh, just off of the Coney Island uh, entry off, uh, up to International Street, uh, we brought the carousel. So really all of the rides that were at Coney Island were brought to Kings Island. But Kings Island was so much larger, we had to increase by 60% our, our additional rides. So we had to add and build more rides. But the, the main feature that we wanted to create on Coney Mall was the ginkgo trees, which lined the old Coney Mall. And uh, those were very hard to transplant. We had a very talented crew, and we only lost a couple of them. But those uh, ginkgo trees, which were very trimmed and shaped and well-known at Coney Island, were brought to Kings Island. In 1973, Hollywood came to Warren County when an episode of The Brady Bunch was filmed at Kings Island. 
Uh, it was uh, it was our first uh, television experience of of, of national uh, acclaim and uh, got a lot of uh, newspaper publicity. I remember uh, George Clooney running around that day. He was just a kid, young young fella. He was out there uh, watching it, running around. Uh, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. They were great people. Uh, uh, easy to work with. Uh, it was Hollywood, but it was Hollywood in Warren County and in Kings Mills, Ohio. And so we uh, we uh, actually uh, uh, took a few days. I think they were there about a week, as I recall, and uh, went very smoothly. And uh, of course, people still in 2009 talk about the Brady Bunch coming to Kings Island. Everybody remembers that. The Brady Bunch was here 35 years ago and uh, shot their episode and you have Mike in the conference room, you know, showing his drawings, you know, that's right up here in the International Restaurant. Tonight, 35 years ago this week. So I thank you for coming in here today to celebrate with me. I probably I remember oh most, besides the fact we got to go to the front of the lines, which was very cool because we got on a lot of rides, as um, Christopher Knight and I went off in the hot air balloon. From the, from the park here, we went out over a field, and, and I'd never been in a hot air balloon. I thought that was really exciting. Yeah, I love the roller coaster, the racer. We did it again today, it's still rock and roll. I love, love the lamps, love them. I remember the crowds watching us film, oh, and, and, and how I was thinking, well, aren't, is, aren't they gonna be in the episode? And sure enough, they're in the episode. You watch, those, you watch the episode of King's Island, there's just people standing there watching us film, the Brady Bunch, in the episode of the Brady Bunch, it's very funny. Out of all the old rides at Kings Island, who could forget the antique cars? It was spawned from the uh, turnpike ride at uh, Disney. And it was a ride where you could, of course, drive it yourself and you powered your own cars and you could put four people, six people in the cars, depending on size. And that, so that was a great ride. And it was a double antique car ride. So we had two sides and it was always packed. Uh, back then, uh, it was just something everybody wanted to do. Digging deep into the history of this section of the park not only uncovers memories of Kings Island, but memories that go back beyond the 40 years this park's even been in existence. I hope you've enjoyed this look back at the Coney Island of the past, as well as the future the Coney Mall at Kings Island has in our hearts. Some of my earliest memories of this great park started right here in what used to be called Hanna-Barbera Land. Scooby-Doo and the gang, Fred Flintstone, the Smurfs, and other beloved characters, all produced by William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, at one time dotted this section of the park. The Hanna-Barbera section, as I said earlier, was a natural fit. I mean, that as much as anything uh, influenced the whole the uh, merger between the uh, two uh, companies. But we had to build a dark ride. We had a dark ride at Coney Island, which we rebuilt two or three times, and then the high water would come in and take everything out of the park. That, that was, again, I hark back, why did we want to leave Coney Island? Because the more we tried to improve Coney Island with animation and rides like you're talking about, the more vulnerable it became. And I had an old expression, I always said, you can stand a flood in your basement, but you can't stand a flood in your living room. And we wanted to become a living room. So anyway, uh, back to Kings Island and the dark ride, we, uh, we bought a lot of, anim in fact, I went to Japan and bought all the animation for that ride, and then I, I hired a guy at Kings Island by the name of Dick Harsley, and he was a great designer. Uh, he worked with animation. We never had a creative guy on our staff like this. And one day I'm walking downtown and I'm in front of Pogue's window and I see this guy doing these wonderful creations. And I knew we needed a guy like that, so I walked in and I walked, I, found out how to reach him and I pulled him out of the window and I explained him what we're doing. I said, we'd like to hire you. So I hired him for Coney Island out of Pogue's window and he did the first dark ride, not the first one, but he revamped the dark ride at Coney Island and I remember it. we were so proud of this. It was very sophisticated for Coney Island at the time. And lo and behold, the river came up and washed it all away. And, and, and I, I, I was just glad to get to high ground at Kings Island. So. Harsley was the guy that really kind of designed this ride in conjunction with Hanna-Barbera. And it was interesting because of some union problems at the time. We had to lock 
Harsley in that ride for a week. We had to lock him in the dark ride. We'd smuggle food to him because he was non-union and that was going to be a problem. There was a lot of stories like that, how, how we got through some of the hurdles. But, um, and, and obviously we made a number of trips out to uh, Hanna-Barbera and talked to uh, Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera and uh, we, we themed every ride we could with the Hanna-Barbera theme and it was extremely popular. It was, a, it was just, it, it was a win-win. It was a win-win for us at Coney. It was a win-win for Taft. And I think brought everybody together and made us all very proud of that park. The design actually emanated from Hanna-Barbera Studios in Hollywood. And uh, they created more or less a, a cartoon uh, expedition, you might say. And then we recreated it in three dimensions. And all the figures that you'll be seeing throughout the ride are life-size. Especially uh, Gulliver here, he's about 15 feet, and the rest of the figures are probably around five foot. It'll be a nice opportunity for the kids to see their favorite cartoon characters in real life rather than uh, on a TV screen in front of them. You get into a boat and come through a giant-sized TV screen surrounded by all the, the Hanna-Barbera characters, and uh, you just sort of float very smoothly through a nice, wonderful cartoon world. Bill Hanna was a very, very close friend of mine. Uh, uh, he became close because I was the liaison between the park and the Hanna-Barbera Studios. And uh, we were working on the music and the idea for that ride and what it was going to be. And uh, I went out to the studio and I spent a week with him and we worked on that concept and idea. And it had, had all the Hanna-Barbera characters, but inside were different musical uh, sections. But the song is Cartoon Friends with Funny Faces, Jinx and Those Little Meesey Chases, Ant Hill Mob and Wacky Races Live in My TV. I'm friends with Fred who yells out yabba dabba dabba do uh, and bosom buddy Barney too. Uh, I love those mumbling bears, I laugh at them until it hurts and when it's banana splits you don't eat them for dessert. Bristlehound is not a stranger, he saves lambs he went in danger, Yogi Bear outsmarts the ranger, all in my TV, those wacky friends who live in my TV. <laughs> Have a happy day. Well, Bill and I were on his boat over at uh, Catalina Island for the weekend, and uh, we'd had a uh, had a long week working in the studio, and we were over there and we started relaxing. We sat down on the back of his boat and we started writing the lyrics for that. And that those were the lyrics for the for the uh, the Hanna Barbera uh, ride. It was supposed to be as if you were going into a big television set and then you saw the cartoons from Hanna-Barbera live because they were all animated in 3D. So uh, it was a great ride. It lasted for many years and uh, uh, it was one of the real gems. It was the most expensive ride we built when we uh, uh, did Kings Island. I think the budget on it was two and a half million dollars, which today uh, wouldn't buy the garbage cans to put around the park. So, but it, back then in 72, it was an expensive ride. It was a great ride and it was a lot of fun. Uh, we recorded the music and those words and the, and the soundtrack out at Glen Glen Sound in, uh, in LA. Uh, a very famous uh, musical producer by the name of Paul Decourt uh, put that together for us. So that's how the uh, that's part of the, of the ride, how the music came about. Okay, the Enchanted Voyage uh, was one of the most popular attractions in the park from 1972 to 1992 when it became uh, the Smurf ride. And uh, that was maybe one of the first real controversies for the park when it did make that change. Uh, you know, guests loved the Enchanted Voyage, but the Smurfs were, you know, at that time, the new popular character. And uh, it was a ride that uh, for the next 10 years, you know, was inside that building. And uh, it was very similar to the ride that you had with the Enchanted Voyage. It was a boat ride that took you through. Oh, the Smurf, Smurf ride. Yes, I remember that. Uh, and Nancy probably remembers it much because she also bought some of the merchandise for Smurf. All the, all the big blue stuff. Everything was blue. We had Smurf ice cream and everything. But the Smurf ride was a pretty big transition. You took the Enchanted Voyage that was 
really a showcase for Hanna-Barbera. It was a museum, basically. I mean, it had some of the old-time characters in it, everything from Enchanted Voyage, and completely transformed it into the blue Smurf ride. So the boats were still there. You still had the carousel you got on. Um, but it had a totally different theme song. And Nancy probably could even hum it for us a little bit. La, 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 There you go. It is the original <laughs> Smurf song. It played throughout the entire ride. And it was really a themed ride, a little bit differently. It was themed on seasons. So you had the spring, the summer, the fall, and the winter seasons. And you had them, you know, Gargamel, the bad character. It was a little more scary. It was definitely more scary for the kids. Um, and you had people like the bad character Gargamel who would go out there and uh, scare a little bit. He was always chasing the Smurfs, him and his cat. So um, it was a completely different theme and the Smurfs were big. I mean, it was a big deal. They were on TV every Saturday morning. Um, so I really think they tried to capitalize on obviously the Smurf popularness and uh, it ran for, I guess, about six years if I remember correctly before it became something else. By the time the, you know, the Smurf craze was over, it was time for something new in there. And uh, then it became Phantom Theater and uh, that was uh, a little bit smaller scale than what you might see at the Disney parks, you know, with the, with the Haunted Mansion, but it was still, you know, a fun ride. It was a different ride. It was, uh, uh, you know, something that uh, the park had not done before. It had some great animation in there. Uh, you know, the, it did a real good job with the theming with the ghost, and, you know, it was a pretty popular attraction. Uh, but, you know, again, 10 years later, it was time for another change uh, with the building, and it, it's now what you see with, uh, you know, Scooby-Doo had made a comeback, so it was time to, to bring Scooby back you know, on a little bit bigger stage than just being a character in the park, and it's now Scooby-Doo in the Haunted Castle. And, uh, you know, if you, if you walk around, you know, Nickelodeon Universe, you know, the longest line you're going to see is, is for Scooby-Doo in the Haunted Castle. The most popular attraction that you had in Hanna-Barbera Land uh, was the Enchanted Voyage. When you went through there, you had all the characters, you know, from Hanna-Barbera Land uh, as you went through the ride experience. And, uh, you know, it's a ride that even to this day, you know, there's people that still remember the song and they still remember the attraction. And, uh, you know, they, they always say if you could ever bring something back, bring back the Enchanted Voyage and put the Hanna-Barbera characters in there. And then later years, it kind of transitioned, you know, as things, you know, things change over the years. And, uh, you know, Nickelodeon characters became, you know, the end thing for young children. So the decision was made, uh, you know, to change it from... Hannibal Baron Land to uh, Nickelodeon Universe, and uh, now you see the characters that are as popular to kids today uh, that the Hannibal Baron characters were. You know, SpongeBob, SquarePants, you have Dora the Explorer, Little Bill, uh, you know, the Rugrats. So those are the characters that now kind of, you know, control the kids' area. Uh, but our kids' area, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a great place. There were also other rides making their debut opening day 1972. We tried to keep it as true and as themed as we possibly could to Hanna-Barbera because again that's kind of why Taft got into the business. They wanted to exploit, promote the uh, uh, those characters. The big ride, the the other anchor ride that came into the area was a sky ride. And uh, the sky ride ran from uh, 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 Hanna-Barbera land uh, over into Coney Island and uh, after we got it stuck one year up there for about four hours one evening on a cold uh, fall night, uh, we decided to take that ride out and, uh, and, and we took it out. But the early pictures, if you look at Kings Island, you see the sky ride traversing the sky at night. Always a beautiful ride, had the cabins with the lights underneath them, so it was really unique. We had uh, Winnie Winsome's uh, Winsome Winnie's Cauldron Ride, and it was basically a takeoff of the Disney teacups. Uh, we had cauldrons that spun around with uh, the witch in the middle of them. Uh, the anchor ride in the in the area was a Scooby Doo roller coaster, which was a takeoff of our old teddy bear roller coaster, which was the children's coaster at Coney Island. So we just we rebuilt basically that size coaster, called it the Scooby Doo. Uh, we had uh, a junior turnpike ride, uh, uh, some other little small flat rides in the area, uh, and we had the arbors leading through the area that took you from Hanna-Barbera into uh, Rivertown and over towards the, uh, the Eiffel Tower. Uh, this part of the park may have started with Scooby-Doo and the gang, but now a new generation of children are here. SpongeBob SquarePants and the Rugrats are the new icons that live in children's hearts. But one simple rule still applies to all ages in this wonderland, and that rule is you're never too old to act like a kid again.
What does an old mining town have to do with an amusement park? To find that answer, all one needs to do is look at the surrounding land around Kings Island. Built at the top of the hill overlooking the Little Miami River, it's only natural that this part of the park be called Rivertown. Well, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted a, a, some theme in there that reflected Cincinnati and the river, and you know, we knew we needed a historical area. We wanted a, uh, most of the theme parks in those days had an historical area, so we just named ours Rivertown. And uh, I th we put the flume in there, as I recall, and we had a, a big restaurant there. Well, Rivertown uh, was, uh, from the created from the the local area of, of our rivers, the Ohio River, the the uh, Miami, Little Miami, and uh, uh, with our great history, we wanted to recreate something that had that uh, theme to it. So we brought the old flume ride from Coney Island. We put it in that area. Uh, we put the train ride with the uh, Indians attacking the train and. Uh, we had a train at Coney Island. Uh, I don't know if you remember the little, we call it the CI and LC, Coney Island, uh, what was it, CI and LC Railroad. And uh, it's the first time we had any serious animation in Coney Island, and this little train started at Lake Como and ran over a causeway at Lake Como and down the lake and into that woods, which was way behind Moonlight Gardens. And in that woods, we had a lot of animation in there of Indians and cabins and shooting at settlers, and it was wildly popular. No one in those days had seen animation. Very few people had gone to Disneyland. I mean, it was way across the country. Uh, basically, people in our region in the Midwest hadn't seen it. So this little train ride, I think we rode 400,000 people that year. It increased Coney's attendance. So we knew the popularity of that. All we did when we went to Kings Island and get a larger train, and we still had the same anim an animation. People were shooting at each other, and the kids loved it. Well, the Beast uh, actually, uh, uh, as as we developed roller coasters, uh, we decided to build that in house, and we had a very talented team uh, of of staff who really understood the roller coasters and had learned as they built the racer and had worked on some of the other coasters in the park. So uh, although we had a lot of land at Kings Island, uh, 1,500 acres I believe it was, uh, we decided to use the terrain. So we used the natural terrain and it was the first time uh, that a coaster was really, in, 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 new, in modern time, was built to the terrain and we used that back section of Kings Island. So uh, the Beast was the longest, fastest uh, roller coaster uh, that was built at that time. And uh, in my opinion, and I've ridden most of them around the world, it's still the greatest coaster. It's got all the wonderful features that you want. The whoop de doos the uh, two drops, uh, and of course the tunnel. Well, my first ride on the Beast was shortly after they took the sandbags off of it for testing. So in 1979, they opened the Beast. Um, they let you know, some of the workers ride it, some of the upper personnel. I was just a kid there, really basically in my second season at Kings Island, and I was lucky enough to be doing setup for the park that day and got to go ride it. It was like nothing I'd ever ridden before. I thought it was probably one of the best rides I'd ever ridden. Still to this day, it is one of my top rides. It was the tallest, the highest, the fastest. It was mean. And I think the thing I remember the most is I kept thinking, this, how, did, how did this happen? How did they build this right into the woods? Everywhere it's built into the forest. And then one employee night, I got to ride it at night. And they turned the, all the lights out on the thing. And we kept riding it and riding it and riding. So we would go right through the train station. I think we rode it about 12 times in a row before somebody probably screamed uncle and they stopped the ride. But I can tell you what, it was one of the most scariest rides at night when you cannot see a turn, you can't see a hill, you can't see anything. It was a phenomenal night. If you, anybody ever gets a chance to ride it at night, to me, that was a great, great ride at night. 
on the beast when we were building it, it was uh, uh, in the spring of 1978 or 9, whenever we opened that, uh, we decided to go down one night. Uh, we were having a meeting in the park, and we decided to go down and light it up. Uh, so we decided to take it out for a test try. And really, uh, no one had ridden it at that point in time. And uh, there were uh, a group of about 10 of us. We, we fired it up, got on it, took off. And uh, when we hit that tunnel, there were no check brakes or uh, any, any kind of other than the main brakes on that system. And we went through that tunnel and we thought we were going to explode and come through the tunnel. When we came back, we were all absolutely white and scared to death. And we said, what did we create? And uh, if you ride the ride today, well, immediately following that, we put the check brakes going down the hill to slow that car down going into the tunnel. But all the conditions were right that night. It was a light rain. It was, uh, there were no brakes. Uh, it was just fast. And uh, I'll never forget that night. And I don't think anybody who rode it that night with me uh, will, will forget that night. We were all pretty, pretty shocked. And we knew we'd created, created something that was really special. And it remains in the top 10 coasters today. In Rivertown, when I worked there, I did take the uh, old-time photos, but to the right of me and to the left of me, we had a wood carver that carved wood. You know, he would have plaques made, just married, and all kinds of things you could have done. And on the other side were the leather workers. They would make leather belts, they'd put your name on it, or leather key fobs, things like that. So during the summer, I would say it's like the summer of 1980. Um, we were all on the front porch together a lot. We all hung out a lot. We went out after work for pizza a lot. And we always felt sorry for this one particular guy that worked at the wood carving place because he was like the only college, high school kid that worked there. The rest were retired people or married people with families, you know, responsible people. So we brought him over. We drug him around everywhere. We just called him Woody the wood carver. We didn't know who he was. He was quiet. He wore glasses. He read a lot. So anyway, we drug him around to parties and to go get pizza. And he had a big car, so we let him drive a lot, drive us around a lot. We had a lot of fun with him. So Woody came and left after a few seasons. and. Um, I remember a few years later, five or six years later, me and my roommate were down at UC at our, at our apartment and we were watching a TV show. I said, man, that guy looks familiar. It happened to be Cheers at the time. I said, I, I've talked to him, I know him, he doesn't look anything, I can't picture him. Years later, we figured out it was Woody Harrelson. So we thought we called him Woody. I think Woody was his real name, but we called him Woody the Woodcarver. That's how yeah. we knew him. So he was, uh, he was the guy we hung around with. This historic part of the park reminds every visitor who strolls through here that Cincinnati has, and always will be, a river town. River town holds a special place in my heart. When I hear the whistle blowing of that powerful locomotive, it brings the past into the present and keeps memories alive. Cincinnati has always had a very strong German heritage. Nothing echoes this more than this part of the park. Right now we're going to take a look at Oktoberfest. That's another thing, Coney Island sold beer. It was just a tradition. You know, in all the ethnic days of the 20s and 30s, you had beer. Well, no Six Flags Park sold beer. You didn't do that. But beer wasn't a problem. There was no intoxication. It was a hot day. People would have a beer. It was never a problem. So we sold beer at Kings Island, and Cincinnati is such a German town, and you had to have a beer garden, and you had to have a fest house. And uh, that, that was, it, as far as I'm concerned, it was very easy to come, come up with these themes. They were all natural. Oktoberfest was a capitalization on Cincinnati's German heritage. And uh, we wanted to serve beer, so we, uh, we created the German Beer Gardens area. And I don't remember if it was the first year or second year that we put in the, uh, the big fest house, but that became a landmark in that area where we put, had ice skating and shows and did the German foods and everything. So uh, we had, uh, uh, we themed the rides in that area, uh, Drunken Barrels, uh, that was uh, taken from uh, an Oktoberfest ride. Uh, so we, we themed the area, I think we had the swinging ship in there, in that area. So again, all those rides and the, and the planning came from uh, the Cincinnati huge German heritage. Well, Oktoberfest was one of those very interesting areas at King's Island, themed very, very well. Um, my recollection of probably um, 
Oktoberfest was lots of spinny rides. So you had rides, you had the spinning keggers, you had the Ferris wheel, you had the Baron Curve, um, you also had the Bavarian Beetle. So if you weren't spinning at one time or going downhill at one time, um, you weren't in Oktoberfest. I think the thing that really got me about that the most is they would fill you full of beer at the Cons Beer Garden. You had the Sausage House, you had the Munchin Cafe, so you had all this food you would eat, and then you would get on the spinniest rides in the world. And, then, and I can't forget the rotor. The rotor was another great ride over there that just spun you until the floor dropped out of it. So um, Oktoberfest, it seemed to be there was a lot of litter getters over in uh, that area cleaning up a lot of content sometimes. It was a very popular area and still uh, popular today. A little different, but uh, uh, I think the German beer gardens today is Bubba Gump Shrimp House. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, back then it was, uh, it was certainly a, an interesting and uh, 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 a great part of Kings Island. Only a few iconic structures still remain in this part of the park. But it's amazing how the accordion music, the clinking of beer mugs, and the smell of bratwurst and sauerkraut bring back the memories. I hope you've enjoyed this look back at Oktoberfest. Well, we had a lot of property uh, to the north side of the park, and uh, we had opened a very successful entity at the sister park, King's Dominion, in Richmond, Virginia, called Lion Country Safari. And we had a drive-through uh, park, uh, animal park down there. Families would come, drive their cars through the different belts, and they would see all these wonderful animals. And we decided to put that in at Kings Island, but uh, we put a little different twist on it in the first year. We put a monorail through the area. So uh, we opened, we had about 250 acres of property over on that north side that we utilized to put the Lion Country Safari in. It was very popular. It was one of the first attractions that had a surcharge. So you had your pay one price when you came to Kings Island, and then you paid another dollar and a half or two dollars, whatever we charged back then, to uh, get in Lion Country Safari. So it was a revenue uh, uh, attraction, and uh, but it was a difficult attraction. The animals were very, uh, uh, it was like running a zoo, and it was very uh, expensive, a uh, lot of maintenance, caretaking, and uh, after uh, about seven or eight years, I think it was, it had pretty much run its course. Those people who had come and ridden the ride really weren't repeat riding like, uh, like we had hoped. And uh, we needed the property for additional rides. That's where Top Gun and some of the other expansion went on into the area. Uh, so the Lion Country Safari area actually <coughs> The animals went away, and so did the name after a year or so. Yeah, Timberwolf, uh, uh, the amphitheater, was, uh, uh, was an attempt, and a good attempt, to uh, provide a concert facility uh, for the park. Uh, it, it was okay. It never really launched into a uh, major concert venue like uh, uh, standalone concert places had around the United States, but uh, it, it, it drew a lot of acts. Uh, concerts, again, ran their course, uh, and uh, as we got into the 80s, uh, performers weren't coming to theme parks like they were in the 70s. In the 70s, it was a great way to meet your audience and come face to face with them. Uh, the business was changing. They weren't on the road quite as much. If they were, they were on uh, large, large facilities, and they were uh, they were expensive. And concerts really were lost leaders. You, they brought people. Hopefully, they bought a coke and some popcorn, ate a hot dog while they were there. But uh, what we were, what it was costing us to uh, pay an act uh, became prohibitive. So it really kind of went downhill, and uh, and uh, it was good. Well, it lasted. Timberwolf, we had, a, we had a fun experience there working in merchandising. So we did what they called hawk the t-shirts. So the, the 
artists would come in and we would usually sell their merchandise for them. Um, we also usually worked along food service. Um, one particular artist you might be interested in that uh, loves Cincinnati, uh, who the original Parrot Heads came out of was Jimmy Buffett. So uh, he would come sometimes four nights a week uh, to come to Timberwolf. So we were actually at the, first, at the very first concert when they first started coining the phrase Parrot Head, you know, not Dead Head, Parrot Heads. <laughs> Um, and that was really at Timberwolf. So I can remember, you know, selling t-shirts next to food service where they were making five gallons of margaritas at a time. So um, it truly was a party and continued to be a party until really Jimmy Buffett outgrew the concert venue there and had to move, uh, you know, to another place to hold more people. But that's really where the term Parrothead came from for Jimmy Buffett was at Timberwolf Amphitheater. Screaming Demon was one of the first looping roller coasters. Uh, it was a launch coaster that uh, uh, began up on a platform, was launched off the platform by a pusher, went down through a loop, up to the other side of the platform, and then was pushed off again. You went backwards through the ride and back up to the other side. Uh, the drawback for that ride was that you had to walk up steps <laughs> to get to that platform. So uh, it was still very popular and lasted for a long time. Uh, one of the interesting things was when we built uh, the amphitheater, Timberwolf, uh, it was right behind uh, the Screaming Demon. Uh, well, the Screaming Demon was one of, if not the noisiest ride in the park. So every time that ride launched off it, bang, and you'd hear the go up the other side, boom, bang. And so if somebody was playing on the concert, you couldn't hear them. So we actually had to uh, shut that ride down during concert periods. And uh, it, it was removed later on when some other rides and expansion went into that area. Over the years, the park has changed a little. Rides have come and gone, and new attractions have popped up. The Winterfest uh, was developed by Kings Island as a way to give back to the community. It was uh, you know, a fun event, it was a place you know, where families could come up you know, during the holiday season, they could ice skate, they could uh, you know, watch some Christmas shows. Uh, there was a lot of fun things in the different shops, and you know, the kids could come up and visit with Santa Claus and, and do that kind of a thing. Um, but the problem with Winterfest was, you know, it was a great idea and concept, but the weather, you know, so unpredictable in this part of the country where, you know, you could have a Friday or a Saturday, you know, when you're open in, in the middle of December and all of a sudden it's 60 degrees and that created some problems with the ice. Or you could have the other extreme where maybe it was, you know, five, six, seven degrees and just too cold for guests to come out and enjoy, you know. So it was one of those things that was great in concept, um, but, uh, you know, it was just so unpredictable with the weather to really make it the kind of event, uh, you know, where you could, you know, consistently do it the way you wanted to. Waterworks opened in 1989 and, uh, you know, it, the time had come for Kings Island to have a water park. Other theme parks around the country were, you know, building water parks. If they weren't on property, they were pretty close. Uh, you know, it's something that uh, you know they would offer their guests, and the land was there to to do it. And uh, you know, Kings Island decided to get in that game as well at that time. And you know, the, the great thing about the water park, Kings Island, since it was connected to the park, was it could be included with park admission. And uh, there was a couple ways they could transport guests in. They could take the train ride back and uh, you know, get dropped off at the water park or they could enter from the parking lot if they just really wanted to start their day at the water park. And uh, you know, as the years went by, uh, you know, it was refurbished, became Boomerang Bay uh, in 2004. And it was Australian themed, still is today. Uh, right now it has more than 50 water activities, including 30 water slides. So uh, it's one of the top water parks you know, in the country. And it's, it's also a place that, you know, there's something for everyone. It's, it's got its own little you know, area for the, for the youngsters. It's got, uh, you know, a wave pool. It's got, you know, some major throw rides. And it's just, uh, you know, just a terrific place. You can spend the entire day there or you can you know, spend some time either in the morning or in the evening. You know, it's up to you. Fear Fest opened in 2000, and the reason uh, behind it was, uh, you know, the weather was really great in October. Kings Island normally closed the first weekend, and, you know, you could go a little bit deeper into the season, but you needed some kind of a draw because, you know, a lot of the, the guests had been to the park a number of times, you know, during the summer. So you wanted to give them something, you know, a little different kind of an experience. So that was developed, and, uh, you know, it proved to be very, very popular at the beginning. Um, and then other parks around the country started doing different kind of Halloween events, but you know, Kings Island was one of the first you know parks to actually offer that uh, that kind of experience for park guests. You know, during the Halloween season, 
Uh, last year, we upgraded the event to Halloween Haunt. It became the biggest, baddest, largest, you know, scarathon in the Midwest. Uh, you know, we had twice the number of monsters. We went from maybe 150, as uh, they had, you know, during the peak for Fear Fest. You know, there's more than 400 monsters roaming around the park last year. There's going to be, you know, almost 500 this year. Uh, you know, the, the mazes became a lot more intense. You know, the, the fear zones became a lot more intense. You know, we went from, you know, still kind of, you know, being a, a fun place to still come and get scared, but changing it from Fear Fest to Halloween Haunt, it became a situation where, you know, no one, nothing off limits. So there was a lot of shock by our guests last year when they first came. They weren't expecting it to really be at the level it was. So if you're looking for the place to, you know, to go during the Halloween season, you know, where you're going to really have the best, uh, you know, the most scariest, most intense attraction, you know, it's Halloween Haunt here at Kings Island. Well, I can't tell you I've been there that much as a patron. I took a tour. I went around the perimeter of it. Uh, the park has to be at least twice the size of what it was when we opened in 72. That was my first impression. My second impression is I couldn't help be out there and not wonder what it would cost to build that park today. I mean, it's got to cost, I would think to buy that land, put that park up today, has got to be five, six hundred million dollars. So I was thinking of cost, I was thinking of size. Um, I can't tell you much qualitatively. I w I'm, I'm in hopes that um, it doesn't become too commercial. You know, it still retains some of the old things. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure the park is clean. That's always critical. And uh, I do nothing but wish it well because it, it made money from the first hour it opened. It was a cash cow from the first hour. I have the dollar, the first, first guy that plunked down a dollar. I saved the dollar, I framed it, and I gave it to my son. But that, that park's been a cash cow from 1972 till uh, last summer. We've learned so much history contained in an amusement park that holds so many memories so close to our hearts. I hope you've enjoyed this behind the scenes look at this amazing place we call Kings Island. I'm Nate Byram, and I'll see you at the bottom of the hill. Cartoon friends with funny faces, Jinx and those little beasts he chases. And you Bob, the wacky racers, live in my TV. I'm friends with Fred, who yells out yabba dabba dabba doo. Who's a buddy Barney too? And Scooby Dooby, where are you? I love that mumbling bear, I laugh at him until I hurt. And when it's banana splits, you don't eat them for dessert. Bristle Hound is not a stranger, he saves lambs when in danger. Yogi Bear outsparts the ranger, all in my TV. Those happy friends who live in my TV. Faces, Jinx and them, their Reese chases. And you mob wacky racers live in my TV. I'm friends with Fred who yells out, Yabba Dabba Dabba Do. Was Buddy Barney too? Scooby Dooby, where are you? I love that mumbling bear. I laugh at him until I hurt. And when it's banana splits, you don't eat them for dessert. Bristle Hound is not a stranger. He saved lambs, he went in danger. Bear out smart set ranger all in my TV. Them happy friends who live in my TV. Yakka dakka dakka doo doo. They live in 